Disease's mini medical school lecture series. We are pleased to host a compelling presentation and discussion this evening on the topic of how to how chronic peripheral inflammation causes changes in the brain that may impact mental health in patients with arthritis, colitis, and more. My name is Hannah Riley, and I'll be the program host and moderator for this evening. Before we get started, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items. There will be two parts to tonight's program. First, each of our presenters will speak for approximately 20 minutes, and then we'll open the floor to audience questions. We'll take a 10-minute coffee break between each speaker and refreshments will be provided to you, those of you here in person. You're welcome to ask questions at any time during the presentations using Slido. To access Slido, you can scan the QR code or type www.slido.com into your browser and manually enter the event code MMS into the participant field to post your question. Questions submitted to Slido will be viewable to all audience members and participants can upvote the questions they would most like to see asked. Now on to more specific housekeeping items. For those of you that have joined us online, if you lose your internet connection and drop out, you can return to this se session using the same Zoom link you used to join us at the start. If you experience any technical issues, such as you cannot hear or see the presenters, please email snyder at buxa.com and our team will do their best to support you. For those of you here in person, we now ask that you turn your cell phone to silent. Please note this event will be audio recorded and the recording will be posted on the Snyder Institute website. Now, to begin our program, the Snyder Institute at the University of Calgary's Cummings School of Medicine located in the heart of Southern Alberta, would like to acknowledge and pay tribute to the traditional territories of the peoples of Treaty 7, which include the Blackfoot Confederacy, comprised of the Siksaga, the Begani, and the Gaina First Nations, the Sotina First Nation, and the Stony Nakoda, including the Chiniki, Bearspaw, and Good Stony First Nations. The city of Calgary is also home to the Métis Nation of Alberta, districts five and six. Now, I am pleased to introduce our first speaker of the evening, Dr. Mark Swain, who is a hepatologist and professor of medicine at the University of Calgary. He holds the Cal Wenzel Family Foundation Chair in Hepatology and is a full member of the Snyder Institute. Dr. Swain has a longstanding research and cl clinical interest in improving the management and treatment of people with metabolic, viral, and autoimmune liver disease, with a specific focus on liver disease-associated symptoms. He is president of the Canadian Association for the Study of the Liver and was inducted as a fellow of the Canadian Academy of Health Sciences in 2019 for his accomplishments as a clinician and researcher. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Swain. Thank you very much. It's uh, great to be here. And it's nice to see Debbie Maines here. I've known for many years, but I haven't seen for quite a long time. I have, I have a long-standing interest in, uh, in uh, how, the, how the body communicates to the brain when in, in people and animals that have uh, uh, chronic inflammation. And actually, Quentin, who's going to be talking second, uh, he and I, we've really collaborated for probably 25 years together in this area. So we're, we, uh, we, we go back a long way and we share a uh, passion for this area. So I'd like to start off with this quote. Uh, so this guy, Jean-Martin Charcot, he's actually considered to be the founder of modern neurology. That was a Frenchman. And uh, um, he, this quote uh, was that uh, our symptoms are in reality nothing but a cry from suffering organs, which you can take many ways. His actually, he has many call to fame, but uh, one of his specific call to fame, and actually his area of specific expertise was in hysteria, so in hysterical illness. So, uh, so you could see how you would interpret this uh, potentially as he would, he is describing symptoms as being a hysterical response to a uh, suffering organ or inflamed organ. But I, I actually, I interpret this differently. I, uh, he, uh, I, I interpret this more that, that he understood that when an organ or part of your body has inflammation in it, it actually communicates to your brain and changes your brain in a way so that you develop symptoms. And this is really what we're gonna talk about here today. So, when, when, when people talk about symptoms and diseases like inflammatory bowel disease, rheumatoid arthritis, liver disease, they often talk about 
the specific organ that's inflamed, and the symptoms are all around. Them. And, and uh, so, they'll often, so say an inflammatory bowel disease, the things that they'll talk about are things like, you know, uh, rectal bleeding, uh, blood and mucus in the stools, abdominal pain, uh, diarrhea. These are all, and if you look at symptom questionnaires for inflammatory bowel disease, it really is describing these symptoms. If you look at, in uh, rheumatoid arthritis or arthritis, what really, what people often talk about are swollen joints, uh, impaired ability to move that joint, pain from the joint. So they're describing the joints as being the driver of the symptoms, which of course they are in these inflammatory diseases. And in liver disease, people talk about nausea and vomiting. They talk about easy bruising. They talk about jaundiced eyes, maybe diarrhea, uh, appetite that, that, that's uh, depressed or increased bleeding tendency. And so when people, often when physicians talk about symptoms, this is the sort of stuff they talk about. But, but Quentin and I have been interested in a very long time is, is, is what, what are often termed the hidden symptoms or the psychological symptoms in chronic inflammatory diseases. And so when you ask patients about what they feel, they might say that their joints are sore, they have abdominal pain, for sure, that's common. But they talk about other things that they, that they experience. They talk about having uh, impaired sleep, anxiety, depression. Fatigue is extremely common. They'll talk about loneliness or social withdrawal because their symptoms cause them to withdraw from their social activity. They talk about about brain fog, which is this inability to think clearly or, or their cognition is impaired with how we, we might describe it. Fatigue and fear, of course. These are, these are things that patients often will describe. If you look in arthritis, it's the same thing. If you look on this picture, look at all the symptoms, and then at the top is the brain, but all the other ones are symptoms that, that people often describe. But the top one are things like sleep disturbance, fatigue, Anxiety, depression, again, cognitive impairment, brain fog, very similar to IBD. And then this is a, uh, a, a liver disease where the bile doesn't flow properly. But again, what you see here, and they get an inflamed liver, same thing, fatigue, anxiety, depression, brain fog. And then this is a, a uh, there's a viral, uh, um, disease that causes inflammation and damage to the liver called hepatitis C. And if you look at, here's a list of symptoms of almost 500 patients. And these are very commonly, uh, I run clinics in this area. And so if you look at fatigue, 80% of people, fatigue is an issue. Depression and anxiety, 60%. Insomnia, almost 60%. And brain fog, just over 50%. And so you, so you say, well, I mean, if we treat that disease, then it, they'll get better, right? Where, well, this is a curable disease now. We, tr we treat this disease with a medication for eight to 12 weeks and we, we cure almost everything. But if you look at the yellow bars or the orangey bars there, you can see that they get better, yes, but they don't go back to normal. So these symptoms persist despite the fact that their disease has been cured. And this is common for all these diseases I'm gonna talk about today. In the Clinton. So, so when you look at, 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 at this, the spectrum of inflammatory disease, they have this, this grouping of symptoms, which, which are common to all of these diseases. So there's something happening that's causing this group of symptoms. And so fatigue is the most common symptom. I'll talk about that specifically. Disrupted sleep, so insomnia, very common, or people just describe they don't get refreshing sleep. Mood changes, so depression, anxiety. This brain fog is very commonly talked about, but often ignored by most physicians, I would say. Social withdrawal, again, often driven by the symptoms that people have. They, they feel that they, yeah, and, and fatigue would be a common one. Well, I just can't go out with my friends. I can't go out and do the things I like to do. So you withdraw from them. And we know that when people withdraw socially, they die early, right? Social connection is extremely important for survival of humans, right? Let alone our, 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 our wellness. And then, and then loss of motivation. People lose that motivation over time. It's often associated with these diseases. 
I'm just going to talk very briefly about fatigue because fatigue is a symptom that's so common. And now, of course, in the modern world, it's unbelievably common, right? Uh, but the thing about fatigue is it's, it's when someone says, I'm tired, well, the, nowadays we all say, well, I'm tired too. That's, I mean, that's the, always what people hear, right? And so it suppresses people's willingness to talk about it. And so they often don't talk about their physician. In fact, studies have shown quite clearly that people don't tell their physician that they're tired because they, they're worried about what they're going to hear back. So they don't, but if they give them a questionnaire to fill out in private, then it's a huge symptom. As an example, this is fatigue from questionnaire in these three diseases. So if you look at IBD, in remission, so these are when the, when the doctor will say, your disease is in remission, you're, you're good, good to go. 50% of the people are complaining of significant, this is moderate to severe fatigue, 72% with active disease. So obviously it's more prevalent in people with active disease. Rheumatoid arthritis, 40 to 70%. And then PBC, that liver disease, which I have a specific interest in, uh, 50 to 75% of people have moderate to severe fatigue. And so when you look at fatigue in, I'm just going to talk about PBC here, but this is, this is actually, you can overlay this on IBD, you can overlay it on rheumatoid arthritis. All right. So when you look at, at fatigue, as I said, it's the biggest symptom. So it's uh, in, in PBC, it's rated as moderate to severe and 40 to 80% of people. And, and again, it's more prevalent when it's asked by question, questionnaire as opposed to when people admit it to their physician. So if you ask the physicians, often they'll say, oh my, it's not a big issue. If you ask the patient, it's a big issue. And so typically higher fatigue scores in, men, in women than men, more common in younger patients, and it's actually weakly associated with the disease severity and, and disease duration, which again is also the same thing in rheumatoid arthritis and IBD. And in, in, in PBC, we have a disease that can, uh, sorry, a treatment that can make the disease go into remission. And so these are people, and responders are in blue and the non-responders to this treatment are in red. If you look at the symptoms, they don't change. If you're a responder or you're not, so all those symptoms are the same. I just happened to put uh, the block around fatigue, but all of these symptoms are the same whether you respond or not. So the physician will say, you're great. Your disease is in remission. You've responded completely to the medication, but the patient's gonna say, I don't feel any better. Okay. And so why do people with, with these chronic inflammatory disease have symptoms? Well, traditionally, so if you ask, ask Charcot 200 years ago, he may have said, well, they're, it's because it's a hysteria. They're worried about their disease. They're, they're concerned about their future. They're told they have a chronic disease that might progress to blah, blah, death. Or they hear all, all these things you hear. And of course, they're, of course, they're going to ha be, have all of these overlays uh, uh, of, of symptoms. And so that's actually led to these traditional discussions that happen uh, with physicians or healthcare workers or whatever, uh, that, that around these behavioral, these disease related behavioral symptoms. And it's, and they're often fueled by really a lack of scientific understanding of brain function. I right? like a pathologist. I don't, I don't study brain disease. Uh, and so we don't often interact like with neuroscientists, like I interact with Clinton all the time. And what the people don't understand what the cause of the symptom is. So they better off to ignore it, which is often the way it is. And there's a lack of specific treatments for improving these symptoms. So that often pulls people away. And also medicine is so busy these days, physicians don't want to open the pa uh, Pandora box of asking someone about how they truly feel because it's going to be an hour before they've got, and they've got another person in 10 minutes, right? So it's focused on the, well, your liver test is normal. You're not having bloody stool anymore. Your joints are feeling are less swollen. So that's what you focus on because it's very tangible and objective. And often at least the people being told things are all in their head, or they'll get better when your disease gets better. But I'm just showing you picture that doesn't really happen all the time, right? It might improve, but it doesn't usually go back to normal. And so it's it's important to recognize that symptoms by definition have to be due to changes in the brain in brain function. I mean symptoms aren't just something that appears like hysteria is a nice way of describing something that just appears out of nowhere really and made up. I mean, symptoms 
like this are generated by changes in the brain. And so the question is what changes are happening in the brain and what causes them to happen? I'll talk a little bit about it, but Quentin's really gonna talk about mechanism. And so there must be something that's signaling the brain from these inflamed organs. So there, there's a, like the organ's not in the brain. So if you have an inflamed bowel, it has to send a signal to the brain somehow to tell it that I'm in trouble down here and change, and that's going to lead to a change in brain function, which is then going to lead to the symptom. So what about the signaling pathways? What might they be? Well, you can only infer things from human studies because humans are humans. So you'd have to do, to do real mechanistic studies, you have to go to animal models, which Clinton will talk about. But we know that there, this purple signal might be from nerves. That's a traditional idea that the nerves get stimulated and, and the signals go backwards, back up to the brain. Or it might be due to stuff floating around in the blood. And so cytokines have classically been implicated. And so tumor necrosis factor, or TNF, you may, you may have heard of that. Uh, IL-6, which is, uh, these are cytokines very important during the COVID pandemic. Dry, they're the drivers of why people were dying in COVID. And, and the, and the, or immune cells going to the, to the brain. And Clinton will talk more about those, but just going to talk about these circulating molecules. So if you look at TNF, so TNF, so anti TNF therapies have been around forever. I don't you know, you might know someone who's on them. I mean, they're commonly used in pretty much all immune mediated inflammatory diseases. Anti TNFs are very common. They'll fix them out, Lumabab, these sort of things, Humera. And what they knew, so infliximab was the first drug on. So that was an infusion of anti-TNF. So you have someone with active IBD, you'd go to a, they'd go to a clinic and they'd get an infusion of anti-TNF and they would describe something they call the infliximab rush. So 15, 10, 15, 20 minutes after getting this infusion, they'd feel better. They'd say, I, I feel really good. I feel so much better. But obviously there's no difference in their bowel in 15 minutes. It takes a long time for that to happen. That tells you that there's some signaling mechanism happening that, uh, that must be involved in TNF. This IL-6 receptor blocker, tocuzumab is actually used in COVID, severe COVID cases, but it's actually used in rheumatoid arthritis as well. And what you can see is in the bottom picture, that's the, the higher that, that bar, the less the fatigue. And so you can see that the fatigue gets better pretty quickly after the infusion. But if you look at the disease activity, it lags. So they're, they're feeling better before their disease is getting better. What you'd normally see objectively, which tells you maybe this is signaling too, right? Something in the blood that you're neutralizing or blocking by giving an infusion is actually preventing a symptom. So I'm gonna turn out to changes in brain function, okay? Uh, Quentin will talk more about the signaling pathway, but so can we actually look in the brain and figure out if there are changes in the brain that happen in these diseases that might explain these symptoms? This is something that I spent quite a bit of time on. And what we've done is we're very fortunate in Calgary to have the Seaman MRI facility, which is a research MRI facility, and almost nowhere else in the world have that explicitly, as we do here. It's an amazing thing. We can actually do MRIs, which is shown in here, this person going into the tube, uh, to look at the brain. And we can do really quite cool things with MRIs. I mean, when people think of MRIs, they think of it. Right? You think of a structural thing, well, I've got a tumor, or I have a stroke or whatever. And that's the classical view of MRIs. But MRIs generate all kinds of information just from a normal MRI machine. And if you have the right scientists, which we're very lucky to have in Calgary, you can do other stuff with that same information that comes out of the MRI. You, not only can you look at structure, but you can start to look at activity of neurons. So the neural, the nerves in the brain in a specific region, like in that red dot, so you're looking how the nerves are, how active are they or how little activity they have. So increase or decrease activity of the nerves in a specific area. You can also look at how the different areas of the brain talk to each other. So kind of shown by the blue dots and the arrows. So that red area is talking to different parts of the brain all the time. While we're sitting there, we're trying not to focus on anything. Our brains are always talking. So functional MRI can let us do that. So I'm gonna talk about some functional MRI studies we've done on PVC. And this liver disease, just because it's of interest, I'm a hepatologist mainly, so I mainly see liver disease. And also, it is a very high symptom burden, this disease. That's, and it has this very specific diagnostic marker. So when you make the diagnosis, you're very sure of it. 
I'm just going to talk about some brain parts here. The specific brain parts don't really matter, but I, I think the changes do matter because I think it's highly representative of brain changes that are happening in a disease where people don't think there should be any brain change. So first of all, this area of the brain is called the thalamus. It's kind of that blue dot in the middle of it. And it, it's a relay station, all right? So it takes impulses that come from our body, which is that red sort of arrow coming. Here it's an inflamed liver, but it could be an inflamed bowel or an inflamed joint. It sends signals up to the brain saying, hey, I'm inflamed. And those signals get processed in the thalamus and they get sent to the higher parts of the brain, which tells us how to respond to that. And that's very important for regulating our behavior, which is our response to it, right? And so the specifics of this don't matter. What it, what it does, so this is a functional MRI thing. If you look at the different colors, the blue here is areas of the brain in a group of PBC patients, not just one, compared to healthy control that have decreased functional connectivity, so that talking between the thalamus and those brain areas. And those brain areas are very, very important for, for, for regulating our thoughts and our actions and our emotions. And these differences are in, in PBC patients that are fatigued compared to ones that are not fatigued. So just having fatigue is enough to change the brain that way. And if you look at the red area, that's the thalamus talking to that area, but it's an increased functional connectivity. So what that tells you in a group of PBC patients, one group is fatigued, one group isn't, the group that's fatigued, their brains are talking differently to those brain regions than the ones that are not fatigued. So that fatigue has changed how the brain is talking. It's not just one, it's a whole group. And now there are there other brain changes in PBC patients? compared to healthy control that are associated with this disease that are, could also be influencing behavior. So I'm going to turn to the thalamus again, so that blue dot in the middle, okay? And now we're going to go to sort of, uh, we're going to look at changes in size. So this is actually more of a traditional thing, although it, we do very specific things on how to measure it. And so when you look in PBC patients as a group and compare them to healthy control, the thalamic size is smaller by five to ten percent. See, well, that's kind of weird. But five to ten percent. Who cares, right? Really? Does it mean anything? Well, that's the same magnitude of change that you see in people that have multiple sclerosis. Uh, if you don't know what multiple sclerosis is, it's a neural. It's an inflammation of the brain disease. So here's a disease where we know that has all kinds of neurological consequences, which is MS. The same changes are happening in the brain of people with PBC. Also, when you look in the thalamus in, in, in PBC patients, their neural activities, so how the neurons are firing within that part of the brain, within the thalamus, are decreased compared to healthy control. Again, what, what does that mean? Does it mean anything? Well, if you look at just healthy controls, you take a whole group of people and you do the same kind of MRI tests, if people have show a decreased neural activity compared to the normal levels in their in their thalamus, and then they're given a mental task on the computer to see when they tire, they fatigue quicker. They have mental fatigue quicker than the people that have normal thalamic activity. So there is a consequence of that. The hippocampus is another part of the brain here. Doesn't these parts don't matter? Just in the end, it's really about changes that are happening that are driving behavior. So the hippocampus is a very important part of the brain. It's very important for mood and depression in particular. In fact, smaller hippocampus in the brain is felt to be the, the most uh, reproducible marker of major depressive disorder in people that have major depression, so smaller hippocampus. And you can do things to make it get bigger and people feel that. Cognition, it controls cognition, memory, and mood. So when you look in PBC patients, their hippocampus is smaller about 5%. Again, 5% doesn't seem like that's big, too, too much of a big deal. But that degree of smaller hypothalamus, that reduction in size, is the same magnitude of people with major depression or neurodegenerative diseases like multiple sclerosis, Alzheimer's disease, or schizophrenia, which are very, very well recognized as neurological issues, right? And they've been closely linked to changes in memory and cognition and brain fog. 
What about psychological symptoms of people living with IBD? Well, that was liver disease. And I'm just going to turn and show you. This is not just, really, not just a, a liver thing. So psychological symptoms are very common in all these but this happens to be IBD. So rates of mood disorders, like, like depression and anxiety, are double those in the general population of the IBD. And they're associated with clinical relapse. So if you have those, you're more likely your disease is to be less well controlled. And that, and that when people get treated for their IBD, often the, the, their symptoms might get better, modestly better, but they often don't go back to normal. Almost all of them go back to normal. And that, and that, and that the, as I said, these current therapies have limited impact on the psychological symptoms in the law. So again, going back to MRI, what can we see in MRI? Well, again, so if you're looking at neural activity, so this is the neurons talking within that brain region itself where these dots are there. And I, the parts are labeled, but don't worry about what the parts are. And, and basically that if you look in IBD patients and compare them to a group of healthy controls, they have greater activity in those dotted areas, those regions of the brain than people who are than healthy control. And those brain regions are very important for regulating behavior. And interestingly, like often people talk about, well, females feel this and male feel this. If you look at the yellow dots in those particular brain regions, th that's where the, in the increases in neural activity was only seen in female patients, not in male patients. And so what does it matter? Well, these brain regions that are here are very important for regulating high, what we call high level social and emotional function. So interaction socially and our emotional responses our processing of reward, everything we do is based on motivation and reward. Motivation to do something to get a reward. It sounds simple, but that's what our brains are doing all the time. And it, it drives our activity. And regulating motivation and memory. And so you say, well, are there any other diseases or disorders that might be associated with these kinds of changes in this area of the brain? Well, if you look in the literature, people with generalized anxiety disorder or GAD, when primary insomnia had very similar changes in, the, in these brain regions with increased connectivity. And when you look at the symptoms that those people have, where we have impaired emotional function, anxiety is, is, is by definition common in these. Hypervigilance means they're very worried about stuff happening and, and worried that it's going to happen. And they have cognitive change like brain fog. What about functional connectivity. So that was neural activity in those little brain areas. Now, what about how these areas talk to each other in people with IBD? So when you look at IBD patients and compare them to, to healthy control, the strength of that functional connectivity between these areas that are highlighted and shown by the, the yellow lines is increased in IBD patients compared to healthy control. So what does that mean? What does that matter? Well, as I say, that, that is, that's the brain talking to itself. And so basically, in the IBD patients, there's, I guess, a one way of thinking is there's more talking amongst those brain regions than you're going to see in someone who doesn't have IBD. So, so there's a change in how the brain is communicating itself when it's at rest. They're just sitting, lying in here. They're not given a task. They're just lying in the MRI scan. And, the, and these areas, and this connectivity, or this talking amongst these areas, very important for our response to stress. Are very important in our arousal, so our get up and go, the opposite of fatigue, and also in our emotional responses. All of these things which are abnormal or altered in patients with IBD. And do you see this kind of increased connectivity in other disorders? Well, again, this generalized anxiety disorder, you see it the same thing. And it predisposes those people to perceive neutral or non conflict type experiences as being threatening and causing them to feel anxious. And also you see it in people that have social anxiety disorder. And that's anxiety or fear and self-consciousness and embarrassment when you're in social circumstance or presented with unfamiliar social circumstances. So what about brain changes that are structural in brains of IBD? Well, when you look in the thalamus of IBD, which is different than in the liver disease patients, their, the thalamic size is increased in female IBD patients that have pain, but not in men. 
in the thalamus, I told you it was a relay station, but one of the things that's really good at relaying, very important relaying, is pain sensation from the body to our brain. And then our relating those up and relating them back down to our actions and response to them. The amygdala is sort of a part of our primitive brain that's very important in the fear response. And it regulates our emotion. And that's where it is in the brain. And when you, when in people with depression or dementia, they have decreased amygdala size. And people that have social anxiety and autism, I'm not saying IBD patients have autism, but I'm saying is that autism associated with social, impaired social function, essentially, they have increased amygdala volume. So what happens in IBD? The amygdala size in IBD is increased compared to healthy control. And so, just finishing up here, do brain changes in IBD patients correlate with the degree of inflammation in the body? So when you look at, uh, if anyone in here has uh, an, an inflammatory condition, CRP is often used, they measure it in your blood as a way of measuring your inflammation in your body. And so CRP is considered to be a pretty routine measure of inflammation in the body. And if you look on the left-hand side, on the bottom there is the CRP level. So if you go to the right, the levels are higher. And if you go on the, on the, on the, on the vertical axis, that's volume of the thalamus. And you can see as your inflammation in your body goes higher, that the line's tipped up, which means that your volume of your, of your thalamus is getting bigger. And if you look at functional connectivity, so this is functional connectivity between the thalamus and part of the brain. Again, you can see that the line is tipped up, which tells you as the inflammation gets bigger, the functional connectivity gets, gets stronger so that the talking between those two areas gets more profound. So I just want to leave, leave you with, a, well, again, the brain parts don't matter, but what does matter is that when, like what I tell to my patients is when, when someone says it's all in your head, it is all in your head. But your head has changed, right? And so the disease affects the structure and the function of the brain in a way that we know changes the regulation of behavior. And if this was MS, everyone would just go, oh, okay, no problem. I get that totally. This is not MS. This is an inflammation in an organ that's far away from your brain, but there's changes that are happening in the brain that are quite profound. And I'm just going to mention this because I know that Quentin's going to touch on it. it, it this, there's a, a growing interest in how the bugs that live in our bowels, called the microbiome, influence our brain. We know that they affect our behavior, and they're very important for our normal brain function. Basically, if you get rid of if you get rid of a, a microbiome in a, in, a, in, a, in a mouse, they don't their brains don't develop normally. So there's a lot of interest in, can we do anything? Is it the microbiome that's playing a major role in this? And there's a lot of lay press around that. Uh, and can we change the microbiome in a way that actually makes some of these symptoms better? And so that ties into how can we actually figure out ways to treat this? It's very hard in people to do that. I, I think by doing the stuff I've talked about, we can look at, at what happens and what changes happen but we really need to do models of disease to, to figure out what can we, how can we intervene to make these, to prevent these changes or reverse these changes. And this is really what Clinton's going to talk about. So I think it's going to be a great time. So thanks very much for your attention and we'll have questions after Clinton's done. Welcome back everyone. I hope you all had a chance to grab a snack and a drink. I'd now like to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Quentin Pittman, who's a professor in the Department of Physiology and Pharmacology at the University of Calgary's Cummings School of Medicine. He's also a full member of the Hotchkiss Brain Institute, Alberta Children's Hospital Research Institute, and the Matheson Center, as well as an associate member of the Snyder Institute. Dr. Pittman is additionally um, the Department of Physiology and Pharmacology's Deputy Chair, Director of Education and Training at the Alberta Children's Hospital Research Institute, and One Child, Every Child Transdisciplinary Training Lead. Dr. Pittman's research program focuses on three major areas, innate immunity, inflammation, and the brain, 
cellular actions of peptides, mediators, and neurotransmitters, and early life programming of the brain by inflammation and febrile seizures. Welcome, Dr. Pittman. Oh, should be able to hear me with it on. Yeah. Okay, great. It's always comforting when there's a break to find that people actually come back. So it's a testimony. It's a testimony to the fact that obviously you were very pleased with what you heard from Mark. And I think he gave a wonderful introduction. Uh, so you might wonder why. So I'm a neuroscientist and I'm in the Hotchkiss Brain Institute as my main home. But we're really fortunate here in, in Calgary because we have a lot of interaction between people in different groups and it's not terribly siloed. And I'm fortunate that even though I'm a neuroscientist and most neuroscientists actually think that anything below the ears is kind of territory that they don't even worry about. But I'm kind of uh, fortunate in a way because one of the things I was interested in for a long time was how the brain responds to, to infectious inflammation. So I've been following with, with morbid fascination the, the COVID, uh, the COVID epidemic pandemic. But I originally started working on the influence of normal inflammatory infectious disease, and we can mimic that in animals and how that changes the brain. And we know that when you get sick, when you have flu or you have a, a bad cold or things like that, you have a lot of behaviors that come along with it. You don't want to go out with your friends. Uh, you don't have an appetite. Uh, you're not very happy about things. And basically, you're not very much fun to be with. And these are the kind of behavioral comorbidities that are associated with when you get an infection. And I started, as a result of that, I got interested in what happens in other kinds of inflammatory disease. And because I'm fortunate that just down the hall or from me, not too far away, are people who actually study a lot of the chronic diseases that uh, that uh, Mark talked about. And uh, the time we started this, uh, we were quite interested in the in the um, this this conundrum that Mark talked about that dealt with the fact that you know people had these behavioral symptoms, but you know was it just something in their head? And it made sense to me or that. You know, if you took a young lady like this uh, lady here, this young girl here, and she receives uh, a diagnosis from her physician saying that you have uh, Crohn's disease or colitis, and then you go and look up on the website all of the terrible things that might happen and uh, the fact that you've got these, these, this chronic inflammation in your, in your bowels and that has these various consequences. Luckily, we're able to treat it a lot better right now, so it doesn't happen. But a number of years ago, you were looking at the possibility that you might end up having to have major surgeries to take out pieces of your intestine, or that you would eventually have to poop into a bag and things like that. So, you know, I think if I was a young person and I thought, this is my future, I might very well be, uh, be depressed as well. So it made us wonder then, the question that we raised at that time was, are behavioral comorbidities in inflammatory disease, what you'd call a natural response to a debilitating disease that you've got a diagnosis for that's really serious, or is there what I call an organic basis to these problems? And in order to, to uh, ask this kind of question, because we can't ask it in people because they have the disease and they all have these, they know the consequences of it, but we can ask these questions in animals. And we're fortunate that in animals, we can actually come up with models of these diseases. So we have uh, uh, models for each of the kind of diseases that Mark talked about. We can do things to animals, uh, give them a, a substance that in their, in their intestines will create conditions that to a certain extent mimic what happens with Crohn's disease and with ulcerative colitis. We can, uh, Mark talked a little bit about uh, bile duct ligation that you can actually change change the uh, the flow of bile into the liver, and that creates an inflammatory liver disease. Or we can also induce a type of arthritis in animals by an injection of an antigen into them. And with these kind of uh, disease models then, and these are models that have been used successfully over the years now to develop new medications for these conditions and things like that. So they're quite well validated models. But what we want to do is we want to test them for the various human behaviors and conditions. And we're going to be interested in doing things like, you know, are these animals fatigued? Do they have anxiety? Are they depressed? Are they socially withdrawn? Do they have lack of pleasure, which we call anhedonia, and brain fog? And these are all of the kind of symptoms that Mark talked about that are chronic in all of these, all of these uh, diseases in people. The problem is, 
is how do we actually get a mouse to tell us or a rat that they're either anxious or happy or unhappy or depressed or tired? They all look the same, you know, like a tired mouse looks the same as a mouse that's not tired. And an irascible, uh, unhappy mouse looks the same as one that's really, really happy. So what we have to do is we have to come up with tests that allow these animals to show us show us behaviors that we think that we interpret as being like a human condition. And we actually never know if a mouse is actually anxious and we don't know if they're depressed and we don't know, but we can kind of tell if they're behaving in a way that we think is similar to that. And so we can use these various tests and I won't go into all of them, but I'll just give you an example of the kind of tests we can do. We can use one to look at anxiety and, and, and Mark talked about anxiety as being one of these symptoms. And we use something that's called an elevated plus maze. So what is an elevated plus maze? Well, what you see is this is a plus sign and it has two parts to it. Part of it is essentially enclosed and part of it is open. And if we put a mouse in there, the mouse has to make a decision where they want to be. If they go out, they have a natural inclination to explore their environment. But the problem is if they go out here, maybe they're going to get eaten by a hawk or, or a, a fox. So animals like mice tend to not run out in the open like this. They run around the walls and in corners and cracks. Uh, but, and we think, and then if they're, we think if they're more anxious, they're not, they're less likely to be out here on this, uh, on this open bar and more likely to be staying in the closed bars. So in other words, if they spend a lot, if they spend less time in the open arms, we think they have more high anxiety. If they spend more time in the open bars, we think they have low anxiety levels. And the interesting thing is when we put our mice in, into these kind of conditions or a rat or any rodent, we essentially see different behaviors. So if you look here on the left, under control conditions here, uh, the animal here, does this show up? Can the people online see which one? Okay. Uh, if they, if their uh, control animal spends a lot of time in the open arms, a substantial amount exploring back and forth, and we can quantitate how much time they spend in the open arms as opposed to the closed arms. But look what happens here in a rodent that has intestinal or liver or joint inflammation. In just about every case, they spend most of their time in the closed arms. They don't go out here and explore. So we interpret that to say this animal seems to be more anxious. So we can, we can, we can mimic the human disease with this kind of a, the symptoms seem to be similar. Just as another example here, uh, Mark talked about people feeling happy. We have a choice here uh, with either eating the plate of chocolates or eating the plate of spinach. And most people will take the plate of chocolates because it's a hedonic, it's a pleasurable thing. So we go for, we go for, uh, for tasty, chocolatey, sweet things. Well, mice and rats are exactly the same. And what we can do is we can give them a choice of drinking from two bottles of water. They can either drink from plain old water or they can drink from sweet water. And you know something? Rats and mice are just like us. They drink more sweet water than other bottle water. And we can quantify that and tell how, how much they, they like this sweet water. The interesting thing is, is in animals with peripheral inflammation, they uniformly show less preference for the sweet water. So they go back to not really differentiating between sweet and good water. And we can say that this isn't due to lack of taste or anything like that. They just seem to be what we call anhedonic. And we equate that to being unhappy. So what, what's the important thing is, is we can, we can mimic these behaviors in mice that Mark talked about in humans. So it does two things that kind of validates the model to say, this is a good model of the inflammatory diseases because the symptoms seem to be similar. And that's something we're looking for. But the other thing that's really important is that these animals have no ability to conceptualize the consequences of their, of their, sim of their condition. So when I give a, a mouse or a rat some, an inflammatory liver disease or inflammatory bowel disease or whatever, they don't know that two, three weeks, a month, six months down the road, they're going to have this, this, and this a condition. They have no, they have no expectation of that. That they can't go and read the world. Well, they can't go online and read about all these symptoms. And so we think that since animals show what we call these comorbid behaviors, there must be an organic basis to them. So if that happens, so there must be something different in the brain. And so the question is, is what are the possible CNS changes? Well, Mark talked a fair bit about neurons communicating with each other in the, in different parts of the brain. 
that there's more or less neural activity between different uh, sex, uh, areas of the brain. Well, can we mimic this in the animals? Well, let's take a look. What we do is I'm basically alert, an electrophysiologist. And if you're familiar with, with, with neurons or with nerves in the brain, they fire off by, by using little electrical currents to fire things. And I can actually go and I can monitor those. And we have ways we can actually take out a piece of brain and put it in a dish and it's very stable then. And we can actually monitor the, the electrical activity of nerve cells and we can ask how well they communicate with each other. And so what you see down here, the very bottom, this is actually that structure called the hippocampus that Mark talked about. And this is a piece of hippocampus right here in the dish. And we can do all kinds of fancy things and stuff you don't have to worry about, but we can monitor the 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 state of the of the brain and i promise you i'm not going to show you a whole bunch of data but basically we can look at things like ask how how well different parts of the brain communicate with each other and we can stimulate parts of the brain and get interesting looking uh squiggly lines like this that then when we measure them we can show for example that hippocampal synapses and cells are more excitable and this looks at a synaptic potential in this case where the animals with TNBS here, which are the uh, which are the ones with colitis here, they show more excitation here. And there's a whole raft of other aspects of the neuronal physiology that we have looked at, and we found they're almost uniformly to be different. And there's very similar differences in all of these different inflammatory diseases. And I'm not going to bore you with all of the repetitious thing, but we can find the same kind of thing if we look at the uh, the um, um, liver disease, inflamed livers, inflamed guts, inflamed joints, okay? So it seems to be the brain is indeed different in similar ways. So the question is, is what might underlie this increased excitability? And there are a number of things that, that we've looked at, and one of them you're already familiar with because Mark talked about cytokines, but the other one is something called microglial cells. Now, the brain isn't just neurons. The brain's got a lot of other baggage. It's got a whole bunch of other cells in it, which we call glial cells. And glial cells comes from the Latin word for glue. And they used to be thought just the glue that kept our, kept our brain from spilling out of our ears and things like that. But in reality, we now appreciate the fact that the glial cells are very important players in brain function. And one of the ones we've, we focused on in this, in this situation is a type of glial cell called microglia. And these microglia are essentially the immune cells of the brain. Now, you know, in the periphery, we have immune cells that are white blood cells and things like that, that, that sniff out and gobble up nasty bugs in our, well, the immune cells in the, in the, in the brain are these microglia and they're very closely related to those peripheral cells. And they're important because they exist in a number of states in the brain. They essentially can be, and we can, this picture here shows that microglia can be non-activated, activated, or phagocytic, but it doesn't really make much difference other than the fact that they change their state. And when they change their state, they actually change what they do in the brain. And we can monitor this change state just by looking at the, how, what the cells look like when we do histology. And this just shows an example here, where if we look at this slide here, glial cells can either be what we call resting, where they have this kind of You've got little tentacles all over the place sampling the brain, saying, what's going on out there? Is there anything interesting happening? And when they find something, they pull everything back in and they become amoeboid like this. And then they start getting busy doing things, okay? And we can monitor this here. Look, 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 this is actual data from a rat here in the hippocampus. And these white cells in here are these microglia. We've used a special stain that can look at these microglia. And you don't have to know the details, but I think even it kind of hits you between the eyes. This one, A, is different than B in terms of what they look like. So we think that there is lots of microglial activation. So what are these cells doing when they're activated? Well, we think what they do is they get busy synthesizing molecules. And the molecules that we're most interested in, and they seem to synthesize, are the same molecules that Mark talked about in the periphery. He talked about using anti-TNF therapy because TNF is in the periphery. He talked about interleukin-6 um, therapy against that in the periphery. Well, these same cytokines are actually made in the brain as a mirror inflammation. So the interleukin and the TNF alpha and such that we see in the brain here, there we have it here and here and here and here, all these cells here are synthesized newly in the brain. So the brain gets this, gets this uh, information from the periphery and seems to make 
a new type of cytokine in the brain. So they make it all over again. It's like a mirror inflammation. They respond to the periphery and they do the same thing in the brain. They don't want to get left out. So they want to do the same thing. And we can actually show that in the brain, some of these molecules are important in the animals. For example, if we take a, a mouse here, and this is a mouse, in this case, it's got colitis and it's got behavioral comorbidity, all those different signs, they are different in the elevated plus maze or antidonic, all that kind of stuff. And if we measure TNF in the brain, we find that it's gone up. There's more TNF there in the brain. Not only that, but if we take a normal rat here, or a normal mouse in this case, that doesn't have colitis, and we put TNF into its brain, and we can do this in a specialized way in the animal, the animal all of a sudden shows the same kind of behavioral comorbidities that it did up here when it had colitis. So we can essentially turn this animal into this animal without the colitis, but just with the behavioral comorbidity. And finally, if we take our colitic rat here, it's got all these bad behaviors, and we block the TNF in the brain, and we can go into the brain and do that, we can actually reduce the behavioral comorbidity. And we can target the brain specifically so we can find out what's going on in the brain. So we have all of these changes in the brain. Okay, but the question is, is how does the brain know we have colitis, liver, or joint inflammation? And Mark talked a little bit about the fact, well, it probably has something to do with these peripheral circulating molecules. So we're able to ask in our animal models if the same kind of changes occur there. So the two likely culprits in terms of how a peripheral organ is going to tell the brain that I'm not very healthy down here is they can either, either do it with nerves. For example, there are major nerves that innervate all of our interior body organs and send messages up to the brain. Or the other thing is we can have circulating molecules like TNF and these white cells, which travel from the inflamed tissue up through the bloodstream and actually get into the bloodstream that, that, that irrigates or that, that nurtures the brain. So the brain, of course, has got lots of blood going to it. And all these molecules here and these cells that come from the inflamed organ can be talking to the brain. And I'm going to just dwell on that, not as much on this one, but I'll dwell here on this, on this circulating thing. And we can actually look at leukocytes in the brain using something we call live cell imaging. And the Snyder Institute has a phenomenal uh, a capacity called their live cell imaging center in which we can actually go and in a live living animal, we can actually go and look at what happens in their blood vessels in the brain. Pretty cool. And we do this, and this is what you see over here is this is this setup here. It's got all kinds of fancy things there. And what we can do then is we can take animals in which we've done some special things to them so that they're their white blood cells light up and we can put a camera over the brain and we can take pictures of these in real time. And what you're seeing here is two different things. You've got an animal here on the top that is a control animal and you can just barely see here the outline of a blood vessel. Okay, nothing much in it. And down here we can see an animal that has colitis and all these white blood cells here are lit up. And what you can see here is in real time here, this is actually sped up a little bit, but whatever the case is, you actually have these white cells that are going through very, very slowly. And a lot of them are sticking here to the sides of the blood vessels. So they're actually sticking to the blood vessels. The same colored neuro, uh, white cells are in this one up here, but the fact is they're zipping through here so fast. Well, you just saw one there that you actually, the camera's not registering them. They're just, it's like you don't have a long enough exposure to pick them up. So the same cells are there as there are up here. Here they're sticking around and they're doing what we call rolling and adhering. And this just shows a picture here. Here we're looking at the same kind of thing in colitis and in liver inflammation. We've got different dyes here, which, uh, which show these in different, in different features. Here's the control. You can see this, uh, the blood vessel, nothing sticking around. Here are these cells here are sticking to the side here. Likewise, here in the liver inflammation, you can see lots of them here on these, on these blood vessels and nothing much in the sham. So again, it's a really, really cool thing. And if we block the ability of these white cells here to stick to the side of the blood vessels, and we can do that with specified antibodies, we can block the behavioral comorbidity. So these animals that have all of this anxiety and what we think is like a depression and cognitive fog, if we stop these white blood cells from sticking to the blood vessels, then we, we can stop that. And what are they doing when they're, 
when they're sticking to the blood vessel up here, they're actually making those cytokines, the TNF alpha and the interleukin that Mark talked about. And they're releasing that right close to the side of the brain. And they're communicating then with the brain through this blood vessel. And this just kind of gives you an overview of this, that we have these inf peripherally inflamed, inflamed organs, and they make these inflammatory cytokines here. And these cytokines there are big molecules. They don't really get into the brain, but what they do is they talk to the brain at the interface between the blood, between the vascular system, the blood vessels, and the brain. And they talk to these various cells along here, and in the and these then signal to the glial cells. And the glial cells that I talked about, the microglia, are activated. They make this TNF alpha, and that affects then the neurons, makes the neurons more excitable, less excitable, etc. And that results in the behavioral comorbidities. So by using these animal models, we can kind of dissect this pathway that is is we that that is possibly we think is also taking place in in the human patients as well there's a few more details you don't have to worry about but those are that's the gist of what we see what we think we've discovered in terms of the mechanisms that underlie this now at the very end mark gave you a bit of a teaser talking about the microbiome and things like that and we have some new data that we've recently come up with that shows that Fecal microbiota transplants can actually transfer the behavioral phenotype. So what do I mean by that? So what we do is we can take here a clitic mouse that has high anxiety levels and all these behavioral com comorbidities, and we have a happy control mouse here that doesn't have any of these problems. And what do we do? We take the poop from this mouse here, and we give it to this mouse, and it turns the formerly happy mouse into a high anxiety mouse. He has no colitis, but we can actually, by changing the poop that he has in his in 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 their intestines, they can create the same kind of behaviors that we saw here. Pretty cool. Now, you know, what's the what's the point here of actually making other mice unhappy? Well, the real question is, is can we do it the other way? Can we take a control mouse that has no anxiety? And can we take the poop from this mouse? and put it into this one and turn it into a happy mouse. We don't know the answer yet, but those are the experiments that are ongoing to see if we can do that. And there is some evidence, certainly we're not, we're not alone thinking this. There's other evidence from some of the other, from some other areas of medicine that transferring, transferring um, fecal, fecal transplants can actually change behavior. There's been evidence for a long, long time that you can modify uh, peripheral disease. In fact, that's where it first started the idea of of poop transplants was to uh tra was to uh deal with with peripheral disease but we now have pretty good evidence in a number of areas that we can transfer behavioral phenotypes as well and i think this is what what possibly is kind of the exciting new area that is going to contribute to our resolution of this problem so i'd like to i'd like to tie up right now by just saying remember and mark talked about it that Physicians tend to change, treat the, the actual source of the disease, but these behavioral problems are what patients often talk about. And I actually, this is a quote here from a, from a patient that I was, uh, and I'm not a physician, but a, a person with chronic inflammatory disease that I was interacting with, who said, my physical disabilities are my own, but my psychological issues affect me and everyone around me. So I might have, you know, problems with my guts or problem with my liver, but if I'm Hard to live with, that affects my family relationships, my friends' relationships, et cetera. So this is an important problem that we think is, is demands investigation. And we hope that the kind of work that we talked about and with people like Mark, that there will be uh, more attention paid to, to helping patients deal with these problems and help to resolve those. So with that, I'll say thank you for this part of it. And I think now it's open for questions and Mark and I will be happy to answer your questions. Thanks very much. So what the question is, what can you do if uh, to treat inflammation in our body? Yeah. So, I mean, obviously, if you have an inflammatory disease, I mean, that is the target of treatments. And and uh, and and I mean, as our first goal is to prevent progression progression of disease, right? So I think that's absolutely critical. Um, there's a lot of interest in in trying to. Do different things to change the inflammatory. There's lots of uh, 
uh, press these days about anti-inflammatory diets and things like that. And um, I, I, I certainly think that, that there is some merit in there. And I, I, what that will show in the long run, I think is unclear. But if I had inflammatory disease, I certainly would be in a diet that I thought was less than inflammatory, for sure. Um, and, uh, you know, there are medications that we, everyone uses for inflammation, like, uh, or like, like, uh, Advil or Motrin, right? And there is some evidence that if you looked at people, uh, developing Alzheimer's and things like that, that there may be a lower instance of people that take those drugs. So there is, there, there's a lot of evidence to suggesting chronic inflammation is a driver. And in fact, if you look at people with Alzheimer's, they even use, there are studies looking at these anti-TNF therapies in people with Alzheimer's, trying to prevent that. So, so, so you know, I, I, I think there, it's a growing field, but, and, and I think there's a lot of interest in it. And certainly if you Google the anti-inflammatory diet, I bet you'd have, you'd have enough tips to keep you busy the rest of your life. But, but, but uh, you know, it, so there's a huge info. And I think people, uh, the important thing is to, very important to allow people to control their lives and their own lives. And, and so, you know, I, I, it's important to follow, if you have a disease, to follow treatments that are prescribed to help your disease. But I think I think it's important for, if someone wants to, uh, say, take control of their diet in a way that simply they feel anti-inflammatory, then that should be improved, right? as long as it's not harmful. Yeah. And of course, there can be room also for intervention at the level of the, uh, behavioral uh, comorbidity. Uh, people who are depressed, anxious, that there are medications and there are treatments for that also, both uh, you know things like cognitive behavioral therapy and some uh, drugs and medications. So even if the disease is gone, as Mark said, sometimes the behavioral problems persist because somehow the brain has changed as a result of this, of this uh, peripheral inflammation. And then maybe it's a time for psychiatrists and psychologists to become involved and help to Treat the patient in a in a more holistic fashion than just dealing with the inflammation in the in the in the intestines or the liver. Yeah, and actually, along that line, we uh, just that we haven't published it. We're you know, we're just submitted to a to a meeting, but we we took uh, uh, people that had inflammatory bowel disease and their disease was in remission. And some people whose disease in remission continue to have significant uh, symptoms, especially pain and things like that. And uh, um, so what we did is we gave one group uh, 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 what's called transcranial magnetic stimulation, where you just put a finger on it, it puts a little uh, magnetic field into the brain, which is being used for smoking, so say, all of such. And, and then other, the other part of that, of, of the same sort of people with the same issue, were just given to a sham, because you don't feel anything on the other side. And what we found was they all got better. And, but it didn't just get better, but it actually, it also, which was fascinating, which, I mean, we call that a placebo effect, right? We know a lot of things have placebo effect. But when we looked in their guts, their gut flora had changed, both similarly, and, their, and the metabolites that they got flora were changed. So, so, I mean, placebo effect, people think, well, that's a bad thing. Actually, it, it tells you that the power of the brain is quite amazing. And cognitive behavioral therapy is just, is, uh, although you know, people say, oh, psychiatrists are, uh, I mean, cognitive behavioral therapy, which often can be given by just uh, a trained psychologist or nurses or social work, it can be given by many different people. Um, and uh, it is a way of, of rethinking how you approach a disease psychologically. And it's highly effective for most things, just that we don't have the time to, to often to do it or the resources to access it. So I think what it tells us a lot of these things our power of our brain over our bodies is quite amazing. We, we need to harness it probably more than we are. I'm curious um, about the percentage of people who have any type of inflammatory I was curious about how, what the percentage is of people who do have one of these inflammatory diseases you talked about. Um, how, what the percentage is that actually experience comorbid disease, like depression, fatigue, anxiety, what, what is, how many people percentage? You said 40 to 70. Well, if you look at fatigue, it's, it's, it's the majority, right? And then if you look at depression, it would be less, or look at anxiety, like, it depends on how you measure it, right? And, uh, I mean, there are different questionnaires on how to measure it, but certainly 
a significant proportion of all of people with all of these diseases experience those symptoms, right? And uh, and there's a, a huge overlay between those symptoms. They're almost like, I don't know if you remember from high school math, where you get Van Dagen with the circles where they intersect, where they all intersect. And there's common things in the middle where they all, that, that where they have a common symptom profile. Like if you look at, say, depression questionnaires, one of the key symptoms on a depression question is fatigue, right? And so there's and, and so there's a huge overlay between all of these symptoms and the parts of the brain that are There's a huge overlay in how, on, on those parts that drive those different behaviors. And uh, but I those comorbid conditions are extremely common, and and they're typically overlooked. So if you look at older literature, they were never even asked for. Mm -hmm. If you look in clinical trials now, that's a huge outcome. It's an expected outcome and of any clinical trials how people feel how patient reported outcome. Rose is the fancy thing that short, people should have so, But any kind of the trial for any medication, though, that's captured. We just have one question or a couple questions now from our online audience. So the first one is if left untreated, can there be any permanent brain damage that resembles permanent physical damage? Because if you got a physical injury, Okay. Well, in our in our in our animal models, we we don't usually find a lot of permanency to things. It lasts. We we look at the animals over a period of two to three weeks. But certainly, there is evidence that the more severe the peripheral inflammation, the greater the effect on the brain, and the longer it lasts, the more likely you are to have long lasting effects. And I like to relate it a little bit to the to something like long COVID. Long COVID can far outlast the, the, the COVID disease, but when you have such a terrible, debilitating, awful disease that creates such a state of inflammation in the body, it sometimes can change the brain so it lasts for a long, long time afterwards. And uh, the same thing is, so I think that, that there can be very, very long lasting effects. Uh, the severity, it's going to vary from person to person, I think. But there's no doubt that even when the disease goes away, a certain percentage of patients continue to show behavioral comorbidity. And I don't know, maybe Mark knows, if if you look at those patients over a period of years, if eventually they subside to a certain extent or not. I don't know. Because we tend to, these, the, the clinical studies are very difficult to do follow-up studies because it's very hard to keep track of people. And you usually tend to take a time, you know, six months later and ask them questions and you do, but are you doing it six months, two years, five years later? And I don't know if we have the answers to that. Maybe Mark knows. I don't think we do, but the um, the it, the paradigm in treating disease, inflammatory disease over in, historically has been start off with the mildest treatment and work up, work up, work up, work up over and over to be years. And, and that whole, that whole, paradigm has shifted quite dramatically. And so people now are being much more aggressive up front with disease and trying to get them under control quickly. So I guess in time, what we'll see is, does that actually change also the, the behavioral comorbidities? Uh, because we don't, if you're more aggressive and you control the disease earlier on, will that prevent the more long-term sort of issue? Uh, uh, Clinton did some very interesting work with, if you take, if you take, uh, Little little babies, and you basically expose them to something like an like an like an infection, like little baby mice or rats, and then you just then you let them grow up and be normal. They're not normal. Their behavior is very abnormal, uh, uh, and 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 so there are changes that happen in the brain where you don't see anything that looks like it should be abnormal, but they stay abnormal. And so I, I think over time we're gonna there, and there's a growing interest among companies that make drugs to try to make drugs that potentially can influence these cells in the brain like the microglia. It might make them less prone to be inflammatory and that might be a way that we treat a lot of these diseases, which is a different type of approach that we're doing now. Um, All right, we can take another online question. So I'll maybe wrap these two top ones into one, um, but maybe you could speak to uh, vitamin B12 injections after 40 years old and whether they help the brain um, and then just the effects of diet. 
Exactly. Back to you. Uh, so vitamin B12, you can measure it in the blood. And so if you're not deficient, I don't think there's any evidence of taking vitamin B12. So vitamin B12 is a, fat, is a water-soluble vitamin. So if you, if I took a whole handful of vitamin B, I would be flushing it down the toilet, in vitamin B, right? Because you just pee it all out, right? So so if you're vitamin B, uh, vitamin uh, B, uh, B12 deficient, sorry, not vitamin B, vitamin B12 deficient, um, you should be taking vitamin B12, right? Uh, the, there's no evidence of taking more vitamin B12 is going to be doing anything because you're just taking it out, to be honest. Um, again, if I, it's a huge effect. So if I give someone a shot of B12 and say, you're going to feel better at that, a huge percentage of people will. And we all know placebo effects wear out over time. And when they come back up, and go, well, you have to come back in a month. And I'm going to give you another shot. And then you feel better again. So that will go on a long time. And eventually it won't work because the placebo effect will wear off over time. So a lot of these uh, approaches have, have a significant placebo effect, which is not accounted for. Also, when people get symptoms of disease and they start to socially withdraw, actually connecting with your family doctor, getting a B12 shot every two days, two weeks or whatever, is a way of socially connecting again. So it actually, it actually, if you have a doctor that's sympathetic and you can talk to them and you, it's actually therapeutic to be at your doctor. It doesn't have anything to do with the B12 shot, right? So there's a lot of complex, humans are very complex. And, and, and when you do, when you look at those kind of things, that's why in, in clinical trials, they try to control as much as they can because there's all of these other influences that happen. Whereas when you when you do something that's not controlled, they don't control for any of these things. So you can come to erroneous conclusions about something. But in the end, if you feel better, you're only not hurting as well. I mean, B12 shots are free. You just pee it out. So I don't have any issues with having a B12 shot. But I don't think you're doing yourself any benefits if you're not B12 deficient. Are there any questions from our live? Hi. If if a lot of these inflammatory conditions are triggered by um, an imbalance in the gut bio in the gut microbiome, how do you know it's cured? Do we do you check the microbiome? Like, how do you define cure in some of these or remission? Because I suspect. My personal experience is that, you know, the, the symptoms decrease when my microbiome gets a little more in balance, but I think that there's still some underlying imbalance in my microbiome while I'm still having some of the other symptoms. Mm -hmm. And that's why it's perpetuating. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering mm -hmm. about... Well, I, I think the evidence that microbiome causes... I, I'm not sure about that. I mean, uh, but the, my, the fact that I, I think I, the way I view it is that microbiome definitely, well, more than likely influences it, right? And it has an impact because the microbiome makes all kinds of stuff that is in our blood and floats up to our brain and and uh, um, some good, some bad, right? And so and when you look at it, uh, my, the problem with a lot of microbiome studies is that what is normal? Right? Like normal, if we, we took everyone's poop here and looked at it, we said, okay, that's normal. And then we'd go out and do, and do another group a week from now and go, hold it. One of these groups is not normal because they're different, right? And 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 people, uh, uh, if you go to McDonald's for a week, you change your whole microbiome, right? And 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 and, and so it, it, the problem with that field is very hard to understand what is normal, right? And, uh, and, and then going back to normal, might for that person might not be normal, right? It might be normal, which is on a chart, but that might have nothing to do with what's normal for them because they might come from a region of the world where where their diet actually drives a very different microbiome, right? And, and so you don't want to be forcing people into a normal microbiome. I mean, it's actually not it's nothing to do with their normal. Thank you. <laughs> it's very interesting from that point of view that the incidence of these chronic inflammatory diseases like IBD tends to vary throughout the world. And uh, many of them are much more prevalent in the northern temperate climates than they are in the, in the tropical areas. And that occurs for a variety of inflammatory diseases and even brain ones like MS and things like that. And 
People don't really know why it is. They speculate, well, if you're in the tropics, you're getting more sun and then maybe vitamin D is important, but they also tend to eat different things in those areas too. So, uh, you know, to study, the study of humans is incredibly difficult because you can't, I can take a mouse and I can make this mouse do this and this mouse do this and I can control everything. You can't do that with people. So we, it's a it's a much, much more difficult job to try to to try to track down the actual influence. How much is microbiome? How much of it is this? How much of it is that? And, you know, and people don't follow their diets and they everybody's got a little bit different diet. Like you say, McDonald's for a week will change everything. You even even if you don't make a movie about it. And, and and if you look at if you look at uh, um, a lot of the, a lot of diseases that are inflammatory diseases or autoimmune diseases are increasing quite significantly, and they increase in every country. I, I hate to say it, but if you see a McDonald's there, you're going to see you're going to see uh, uh, um, uh, autoimmune disease go up because the, the, once they start to westernize their diet and and get what we think is normal, uh, the autoimmune disease will go up. And, and 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 so there is definitely an impact of diet and microbiome on the and and probably also because those countries as they as McDonald's show up are often in the developing path. So they go from like there's a book called Let Them Eat Dirt, right? Or Let the Children Eat Dirt. It's basically the idea is that we're becoming right? that everything is washed, and everything's clean, and we're not getting exposed to all the things we need to be exposed to. And I think that. When you look at COVID, highlighted quite clearly that if you take kids and you put them and you mask everyone, you keep them away from school, and then you re-expose them, like in England, there was a rash of kids that got that got liver failure from just being exposed to viruses that we normally get exposed to. Now there's this whole outbreak in China, which is probably just normal normal bugs that they would have been exposed to, but they weren't exposed to. So uh, there's all this thing about cleanliness and changing diet, and, and it's impacting our health. But we and we have to really experiment because we have no idea how it's going to turn out in the end. So unfortunately, we're out of time, um, so we'll have to wrap up here. But I want to say a huge thank you to our presenters. Your presenting presentations were excellent, which I'm sure everyone agrees. I'd also like to say thank you to our sponsors, AstraZeneca and the Hemming School of Medicine, the Snyder Institute for Chronic Diseases, Buxa, and each of your audience members uh, for attending tonight's lecture. We hope that you enjoyed it and invite you to join us on January 8th for our next lecture on pancreatic function and glucose regulation in pregnancy and diabetes. Thanks for joining us and have a great night. Thanks very much, everyone. Thank you. Yeah.